that would make our neighborhoods and our schools and our families safer. You may think not. You may think that we're doing too much in Massachusetts or just enough, and I think that's a valid position to take. John, you've, you've got a comment as well, John. Yeah, I, I too am a gun owner, and I think we should put everybody through a universal background check, but Congress has said, leave it to the states, and so there are 33 states. I, you may not know this, and this is important information. There are 33 states where you can buy firearms without an ID, never mind a background check, from private gun dealers. So there, it's absolute truth. So you can, you know, that's, how do you know if somebody's a criminal unless you've done a background check or even a proof of ID? But there's no requirement in 33 states, including Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, and 60 per oh, Well, I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about drugs, but 60 percent of guns checks. traced to crime in Massachusetts come no from out of state, where there's no background check requirement for private gun sales. Like, that we can check the uh, facts on all that. If you don't believe it, you can check it on that, and both of you will find out whether can, or not the other's right. But I think what John says, Congress says, what he's really saying is Congress has not taken action otherwise. I mean, Congress obviously doesn't make statements like that. Congressman, can I just point out one thing to you for a second? Can you the do Supreme it Court, it'll time. be 10 seconds. The Supreme Court may have said, you know, what you said, but the Constitution says that the people's rights to bear arms shall not be infringed. Right. But the court is the interpreter of the Constitution, and, and whether we agree with it or not, unless you want to delegitimize the law in this country, you know, that's I'm what the, the interpreter it. does. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, hi, I'm Mike Bogart, formerly a lend now of uh, Georgetown. Um, just, I heard a, uh, a statistic yesterday on the news that said that uh, they prevented uh, card registrations, prevented over 700 felons from getting firearms. And, uh, but it's only resulted in 54 prosecutions and only 18 successful ones. So, you know, there's got to be a little more than just, you know, there has to be some some way to make the law stick. Like we had Botley fought the gun law here in Massachusetts. They ended up not working out too long. But, okay. Drew, I'm sorry, you're going to hold the microphone closer. I can hear some folks having difficulty hearing. Okay. Uh, we had Botley Fox gun law here in Massachusetts, which originally was written um, that if someone was arrested in the perpetration of a crime where a handgun was used, he would go to jail for a year. By the time the Massachusetts legislation got through with that, it ended up being anyone with a handgun goes to jail for a year ended up being really not enforceable. So we have to do something about it. If we do registration, we have to find a way we can enforce it. Secondly, with regards to mental health, I blame the mental health industry, and it is an industry, on a lot of the problems because it's, mental health treatment has changed so much over the last 30 years. If someone had a psychotic break 30 years ago, they would go in a hospital and they would be treated with medications, sometimes two or three weeks till they found out what worked and let go. Now they go to a mental health institution there for three days, the insurance company kicks them out, often in worse shape than they were in on. Okay, and that happens all the time. All right. Thirdly, one more quick, one more quick suggestion, a positive suggestion. Why can't local police stations have a voluntary citizen armory where if you live in a high crime area, you can store your handguns and your weapons at the police station so you don't have to worry about people breaking in and stabbing them. You don't have to worry about kids getting a hold of them that shouldn't. Bobby, and the and police station is open 24 hours a day, so it's accessible to me. Just a suggestion. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for the suggestion. Congressman, can I take the mental health aspect of that? Yes, question? sir, Dr. Please. Yes. Um, I, I think he's absolutely right that uh, because of the way in which mental health stuff plays out, there is less support for uh, mentally ill people in the community. Uh, it used to be that everybody who was mentally ill went into a hospital and stayed for a long time before they were released. Now they are uh, released fairly quickly. There is very little follow-up in the community. Uh, and uh, there are many people who go off their medications and again become uh, uh, psychotic. Now, uh, sometimes that's because they can't afford medications, and that's a problem. Uh, but we need to do more, and particularly with those people who have a history of violence and are mentally ill, that's where we need to focus the attention. Thank you. Sir? Hi, my name is Jason Burrow. I'm actually from Bradford, Massachusetts, but I was a lifelong Lynn resident. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone. Welcome for back. <laughs> I just wanted to thank everyone for their time. Uh, this afternoon, I think this is important, but I do have a couple of things to say. Uh, you had mentioned the, the, uh, the Heller case, 
So the U U.S. Supreme Court decision in D.C. versus Heller upheld that arms in common use for personal self-defense at the time are protected under the Second Amendment. There are approximately 5 million AR-15 semi-automatic rifles owned in the U.S. by law-abiding citizens for personal defense use. I would like to know how, uh, uh, or for someone to explain to me, how a ban on these rifles is not unconstitutional. Please also note that this uh, type of rifle was used in less than 1% of gun murders in the U.S. in 2011, according to FBI statistics. Right. Now, I want to just preface this that say, well, how can you call it a personal defense weapon? We just had the Department of Homeland Security just put in a bid to buy 7,000 uh, uh, assault rifles uh, for personal uh, defense. That's what their definition of these rifles were. They were selective fire. So they were exactly, they were selective fire, which means that you can actually go full auto instead of just one pull, one, one pull. Can you do this? I have to the, uh, another question I have from Massachusetts, uh, you passed, uh, in Massachusetts, we passed uh, in 1998 one of the most comprehensive gun control uh, legislations in, in the country at the time. This law restricted the gun rights of law abiding citizens by prohibiting the ownership of certain firearms, limiting magazine capacities, and putting onerous licensing requirements in place. Because of these aforementioned restrictions, licensed firearm owners in Massachusetts decreased. From 1.5 million to 200,000 from 1990. I'm going to have to ask you to just get to your point, if you would. In a recent Boston Globe article, the murder rate in Massachusetts went from 65 in 1998 to 122 in 2011. Can you please explain to myself and others why you feel that further gun control laws affecting law abiding citizens will reduce gun violence, knowing that past legislation is not being effective? Thank you very much. Anybody want to take a shot at that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you, you basically... <laughs> I think there are a bunch of people that want to answer, but I just want to find out which one first. Yeah. Well, just to reiterate, I would speak to the second part of your question, which is that, you know, I agree Massachusetts has some of the strongest uh, laws in the country, but if I can go to New Hampshire and buy the gun, it, it's just a car ride away. So um, I think we have to keep in mind that that's exactly why we have to have this conversation about a federal response here, because the state response isn't enough. Thank you. Thank you, sir. You know, I, I've, you've got a huge line behind you, sir. And, and I know from convincing what's going on, others are going to share your view. Uh, my name is Greg Tibbrough. I think that uh, what's needed is a comprehensive program to get rid of not only the illegal guns, but the unwanted ones. I think a lot of uh, law abiding citizens, especially in Massachusetts, have guns that they would like to get rid of or don't realize that they need. Julia, you put the microphone up to us. Yeah, and I don't think they, they realize that, that uh, they, the guns that they own are it's illegal because they're not licensed. Uh, so, a comprehensive program, every police station should, you should be able to learn to drop a, uh, a weapon on, or a fire station. People might be less intimidated to do that. Uh, also have two lines where either anonymous or, uh, or with a reward where someone can point out or say point, point the police to a, a, a gun that's illegal. And then also a buyback program or some sort of a, a program where somebody who has a gun can go and, uh, and then go to a gun store and sell it. Thank you. Uh, either Chief want to respond to that or? I would like to. Who's that? Oh, Mayor. <clears throat> we just, uh, uh, thank you, sir. We, in Newburyport, just partnered with a local bank who was able to give, um, you know, a financial bonus to individuals who decided for those reasons they didn't want their guns anymore for whatever reason. And if anyone was concerned about the fact that it might be illegal, the uh, police officers would actually go to the house and pick up the guns. It was very successful. Within a course of two days, six, over 60 guns were uh, collected in our city. And I, I think it's a good plan. Thank you. Thank you. The Chief Champagne, did you want to come here? No, I, 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 that's a fine program. And, and, uh, in PD, anytime anybody is, has a firearm that they want anymore, they just come to the police station, turn it in. We'll accept it. No questions asked. Gun buybacks um, seem to take guns off the street and um, otherwise you'll be used in crimes. So I think it's a great idea. Sir? Yes, my name is Walter Powell. 
Uh, I almost love this being when I witnessed the, what I consider a very, very uncomfortable outburst on, by the people who are very pro Um It's fear of me. And I said to myself, Lord, I wouldn't want to meet one of these people outside this building if they had a weapon in their hand. <laughs> I want you to know that I'm not scared. I'm sorry, go ahead. I want you to know that I, and I'm sure many of us throughout the country, support rational, sensible, and reasonable gun control. And I implore you to please consider and to continue your efforts to achieve something within our Congress that will resemble some degree of self control and gun control for those of us who feel we are endangered by an accident. Thank you. Student at UMass Boston, and um, I'm doing a research on a, on a bill originally introduced uh, last year by Representative Rogers. Uh, the bill is a HR 3523 uh, of uh, the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, which uh, would allow private companies to disclose uh, confidential information to the government. Um, my question to you is. The White House is strongly opposed to the bill saying that while, while it protects private corporations from uh, legal lawsuits, at the same time violates our civil liberties as well as our privacy. My question to you, uh, Congressman Kennedy, uh, if you would be uh, kind enough to answer this for me. Should a bill similar to H.R. 3523 make it for a House vote? Would you support it? If not, what amendments do we have to pass to gain your support? You're talking about cybersecurity? Yes. So it's a little bit of an off tame from, from gun safety on that. The I think you're talking about a bill by Mike Rogers that I've not fully read yet or worked on it. He is not moving along the process on that basis. But we have a lot of work to do in cybersecurity. Uh, we have a group being down in MITRE Corporation that's been pulling people together. Uh, we have action over on some of the bases here in Massachusetts that are cyber centers on that. And we're trying to work toward a solution. Main problem being that Private companies have a lot of involvement in that. If somebody can break into their system, they can get into a lot of other systems. And some of the smaller companies don't want to spend the money or take the expense of putting in the kind of protections up to the standards that are required. So what the debate really is, do you mandate you know, this protection in there and no standards to be implemented, or do you try to get people to come along voluntarily uh, so that it works? And if it's voluntarily, what happens if somebody steps off the plane and makes everybody else vulnerable? Those are big questions, and they haven't been answered yet. I know there's a series of hearings going on, so I can't give you a complete answer about what amendments I would support or whatever, because we haven't heard what alternatives are out there yet, and that bill is still working its way through the process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just finish the saying that I think it relates to this because not, uh, not only uh, besides gun shows, I think the internet is one of the easiest ways for, uh, for people to uh, gain access to guns. So I, I'm not a guy, okay. but I do understand the other side. So I guess thank okay. you for. Uh, well, I do now. I see the connection. I appreciate that. And it's certainly, cybersecurity is a huge issue facing us right now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Tom Lippert, uh, Lynn resident. This is to uh, the district attorney, the, the law enforcement personnel. With the Fox, the Barkley Fox laws, um, mandatory one-year possession of uh, weapons. How many people have you prosecuted under that? Dozens of people since I'm a district attorney. Percentage what? Percentage wise. Percentage -wise. I, you know what, I could get that answer to you on Monday, percentage-wise. We have a Lynn Gun Club, sir. This is a priority prosecution for me. And we're serious about it. We have one judge assigned to it. It's 120 days. If you're charged with a gun offense, a 10-A offense, from start to finish, in 120 days, you get a trial. And we always ask for, for uh, committed time. We often be finished. We take it seriously. It's an important issue for me and for this community. Now, I'm not a legislator. I'm not a judge. I'm a district attorney. I know that, sir. So I make it a point to put my best prosecutors in that gun court and make sure we ask for the maximum on anybody who's, who's, who has been charged with an illegal firearm or tenant. Yes, but how many have gotten the one year mandatory, uh, percentage wise, do you think, off the top of your head? Probably 20, 25% since we set the gun court up. Thank you. Sir. Hi, yeah. My name is Rick Gumanian. I live in Lynn. And uh, the first thing I want to say is I want to thank the Lynn taxpayers for providing these facilities. They weren't provided by the government employees. Now, uh, the, uh, 
I think the biggest problem in this country is that we have way too many laws that criminalize, illegalize freedoms. So we have, we have too many uh, police enforcing too many laws. It's all of this government violence that is the biggest cause of violence. Like, for example, uh, I'm sure most of you have ever heard of Al Capone and Elliot Ness. Well, those violent gangs were produced by government policy. They were produced by the illegalizers, drug fighters, prohibitionists, who used the law in order to commit violence against millions of fellow human beings. They, 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 they treated beer drinkers like they were criminals. Just like today, they treat people who prefer, say, marijuana over a martini are treated as criminals. It's all this violence that's being committed in the name of the law. And this is what more and more people have no respect for the law. And as far as the young people, young people, you know, they look at the, uh, uh, they look at the, uh, they get the accused from the adults who are in power. And the adults who are in power, like you folks, are violent people. You want the law, you want more laws, more police, more prisons, more everything, more violence against people. Thank you. I do know, you know, that uh, during Al Capone's time, the machine guns became a serious problem and the NRA was amongst the leaders looking to ban them. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, yes, sir. Today I'm a Lone Residence. I'm Ryan Lippert. Um, I'm a high school student at Lynn Tech. I have one question. You guys talk about community guns, how they're used by criminals. Instead of going after the legal gun owners, why aren't you going after the criminals? Yeah. We go after the criminals the best we can. We need, we need the cooperation of the public. We need victims to cooperate. Uh, the no snitch rule is a big problem for us in terms of successful prosecutions. But I will tell you that the Lynn Police Department and the state police decided to get a uh, gang task force to do a very good job of making it clear that we're serious about this. And I asked Officer Freire to talk specifically about community guns because it's a phenomenon that most people aren't aware of. And it's a real problem. When somebody gets a gun, and people from a gang have access to that hiding spot and use it. But believe me, we take it very seriously. We've had some very good, successful prosecutions resulting in incarcerated time because of it. My name is David Fortini. I live here in Lynn, Massachusetts. Uh, I have the FBI crime statistics for 2011. So they show that Massachusetts ranks at number 17 in firearm homicides across the nation in 2011. Number one went to Hawaii. Number two actually went to New Hampshire. New Hampshire gets a D from the Violence Policy Center for gun laws. Uh, the Violence Policy Center later goes on to say that it shows that states with strict gun laws have lower gun homicides. But if you look at what they rate states for gun laws, they have an A through F ranking system. F is a failure. Seven of, the, seven of the states that rank higher than Massachusetts, or, or better than Massachusetts, I'm sorry, they all get either a D or an F for gun laws. So why is it that states like Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine, which have very lax gun laws, have such low homicide rates with what? firearms? <clears throat> In addition, this big ban of assault weapons, why is that? Rifles are used in less than 4% of crimes in the United in homicides in the United States. Shotguns are used in more homicides in the United States than rifles. Assault weapons are a subset of rifles. Hands and feet, they're used in more homicides than shotguns. So how does banning assault weapons do anything to reduce crime? In addition, magazine bans go on YouTube. There are many videos which demonstrate that a person who knows what they're doing can fire just as quickly with a 10-round magazine as with a 30-round magazine. All it takes is a little practice. One last point. Get 10 seconds, sure. Mr. Rosenthal, I'd really like to see those ads that you claim show that they advertise guns that are fingerprint resistant. I've never seen those. I'd like to see some of the other ads that you claim to exist. I've never seen them or been able to find them. Thank you. Thank you. Congressman, I'm just like to your wife for three. Wonderful person. Um, I'm a 50-year 
member of the NRA. The NRA that, you, that I know is not the NRA represented by many people here today. The NRA followed the Swiss model, where you were trained for military service, you had your guns locked up very carefully, and you were very, very careful about weapons. Now, coming from the Vietnam era, I criticize everybody, police departments, the government, and you're all here as symptoms of a problem. Part of the symptoms of the problem is that the NRA is controlled by fringe groups that are henchmen for lobbyists. Now, in Vietnam, if you look at the movie, if you look at the movie, One of the Fourth of July, you will see Tom Cruise stand up as a Vietnam person. Two, he was born two days after me, and he can't use his weapon. The reason why he couldn't use his weapon is lobbyists had different powder in the weapon that were issued to our troops, and the weapons didn't work. And after a firefight at night, you would go out and see all these dead soldiers, and the only thing that Vietnam left were our M16s that didn't work because lobbyists provided weapons that didn't work. Now they're doing the same thing, providing weapons of mass extermination. My daughter here is from Sierra Leone, and that's where they use weapons of mass extermination. I don't believe in taking like weapons. Well, I, do, 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 like. yeah. I don't believe in taking weapons away from homeowners because I don't necessarily think police are honest, federal officials are honest. You have a right for a weapon in your house to protect yourself. A small felony should not take a weapon away from somebody protecting themselves in their house, including police officers that are charged with uh, a small uh, domestic dispute. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. First off, I'd like to give my sincerest condolences to the loss of Miss Alvey, sorry, bad pronunciation, son, as well as for the other parents who lost their children in perfect murder that took place in San Diego, Mr. Tierney, Mr. Blodgett, law enforcement officers, and ladies and gentlemen of today's panel, my name is Ian Sturbeck, and I stand before you today as a Lynn resident, a Marine combat vet, exec protection agent, and a firearm instructor that teaches one of the most sought after personal defense curriculum in the firearms industry. My question today is why is Massachusetts one of the only states that it's up to each and every individual licensing officer to determine whether or not you are able to carry a firearm loaded on your person? An example is I live in Lynn, thankfully, thank you sir, that I am able to carry a firearm for personal protection on me. But another example would be PV, where another one of my instructors was a, in the Army for eight years, carried a squad automatic weapon overseas in multiple high threat environments yet was denied the right to be able to carry a firearm on his person. He was given a Class B license, which only limited him to revolvers and shotguns and rifles to carry in his home only, not on his person. So my question is, why is Mass the only state that is like this and not even across the board? Thank you for your question. I, I frankly don't know, but they, I do know that we invited a lot, number of state representatives to, to be here, and, and no, none were able to attend. But John, do you have an idea what? Yeah, Massachusetts is a uh, may issue versus shall issue or must issue state. So it's at the discretion of the police chief in the town where you live uh, to issue the, the licenses. Uh, it, unlike some states where if you apply for a concealed carry permit, it's if you pass a background check, you're uh, required to issue it. That's not the case in Massachusetts. We're an urban industrial state once again. We do happen to have the lowest firearm fatality rate except for one state right now. And um, uh, unlike what we've heard from somebody, uh, I can't remember which person, uh, according to the Center for Disease Control, states with lax gun laws overwhelmingly have higher firearm fatality rates than states with tough gun laws. It's just the way it works. Thank you. Next, please. Oh, I'm sorry. No Hi, my name is Rob Webb. I'm a Nahant resident. Um, I just want to thank the panel, and I want to express my deepest concerns to you. No one should have to go through what you went through. Um, we're very lucky to live in a society where we can have conversations like this, uh, where people can speak from logic and reason and arrive at tough solutions to tough problems. The problem I see we have, though, is emotional overcorrection, where people uh, apply uh, significance to events that are very rare in their nature, but because they're horrific, uh, we try to just do something, do anything to solve that problem. 
My question is, what are we doing for the things that happen every day to people at a much you know, greater individual scale but a smaller national scale? Uh, the inner city problems. Because most of the gun homicides in this country occur in like the top 50 or 60 urban areas. We don't talk about that. If we remove them out of the equation, the United States has the lowest murder rate in the world. Put those back in, we see that all the gun homicides are concentrated in these areas. We need to have hard conversations about socioeconomic status, race, religion, culture, education. Those are the problems. Those are the roots of all the violence in those areas. Not the guns, not the tool. And the AR-15 is not owned by people that live in these areas because of restrictions in those cities and in those urban areas. So clearly addressing the AR-15 and the high capacity magazine problem, we're, we're not identifying the problem correctly. And I think it's up to this panel, especially people that don't feel the way I do, to get educated in those areas. And people like Ian are happy to educate people on those, in those areas. That's how we're going to arrive at the real solution to these very, very hard problems. <coughs> not by demagoguery, which only drives up demand, drives up costs, and makes it harder for law-abiding citizens to get proper and safe training when ammo is expensive and guns are expensive. Then you wind up with people stockpiling and not getting the training, and then it makes it much less safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to preface this by saying I'm a five-year Army veteran, disabled veteran, former police officer, have multiple degrees, and so I'm not, the, uh, I'm not some smuck off the street. I've seen a lot of this before. I've been in, in shooting incidents before. Um, I'm going to cite one quick statistic. Um, I looked through the, the uh, data from 2006 to 2010, 72,000 ish homicides in the United States in that time period. And this was all brought up about because of one mass shooting incident. Uh, a, a mass murder is considered four more murders. And the statistics, when you drill them down to those committed by firearms, four or more is less than 0.42% for the, all of the murders in four years. So uh, I, I understand the, the gut wrenching. Uh, issue that this brought up, the Sandy Hook, uh, but it, it actually, it goes, again, it, it goes against common sense to restrict legal gun owners that have had, never had an incident in their lives. It ha some of them are highly trained, uh, some of them have uh, been uh, preventing crime and enforcing crime uh, from, from having weapons. I'm also a competitive shooter. Uh, we talk about magazine restrictions. I have a ten round. I have a bunch of ten round magazines. Unless I'm being a, 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 have a police officer returning fire at me, I could walk, you know, walk through a mall, you know, hypothetically, and change magazines at will rapidly, and, and that's not going to prevent anybody from doing anything. On, on, and on that point, there's hundreds of millions of large capacity magazines in the country already. How do you plan on restricting all of them? There's over 400 million firearms in this country. How do you plan on, you know, you got, uh, if we create a national database, in most countries that's led to confiscation. It happened in New York with, uh, in 1991, they tried to confiscate certain weapons. And, and, and one, of, one of the further point. Yeah, uh, I just that want to make, make your point, but I just want to let you know that you're at the end there. Yeah, I just want to make one further point. I also have a son who's three and a half years old who has cerebral palsy and is in a wheelchair. I am going to defend my home from whatever threats come through that door. I cannot retreat. And there are a lot of other people in that situation. And the Mass Criminal Justice Training Council talks about an M4 as a force multiplier from the police academies themselves. Um, I need a force multiplier because I'm the only person there. If I have multiple assailants enter my property, a 30 round magazine is going to be a, a, a great deterrent and a great force multiplier for me to defend my family. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Francis Noon. I live here in Lynn, and I have a few broader scope points that I will make. Um, first of all, I just want to first of all, I just want to recognize that this isn't a theoretical thing for, that we're philosophizing about, um, and people here and people on the panel have experienced gun violence and directly. Um, and also, I want to just recognize everyone for being here to partake in this conversation. Um, first part for me is the Second Amendment is, I want to speak to um, or have us consider the essence of the Second Amendment 
in having the right to bear arms is that at its core, it's a citizen's right to protect ourselves from a government that may have taken too much power. Um, also note that our government, though, we're made up of people, so it's people taking power, and it's about a balance of power. So that's at the core of it. And when this came up with Newtown, I was surprised by the reaction from a few people where they say, oh, I don't want bans on assault rep weapons. And then it, it, it clicked for me that, oh, they don't want an infringement on their right to protect themselves. And they don't want a concentration of guns only to be in the government, because that's an unbalance of power. That said, when another fellow human being or a citizen uses an assault weapon on other people, they are violating that other person's life. So they are infringing on another person's balance of power. And we need to speak to that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wow, okay. Um, I would like the police officers to have more guns than anyone else on the street, to have more powerful guns. I enjoy government. I would like my government to be better armed than citizens. Um, my name is Carrie Zagarella. I'm a, a kindergarten teacher in Ipswich, Massachusetts. I'm a former teacher in Lynn. A um, couple things I bring as a kindergarten teacher is that when I see a lot of misunderstandings, I want to have a repetition of the content. Massachusetts is not trying to take away any more guns. We're talking about what we can do nationally because we are a model. Second thing, if somebody comes into my classroom with a hammer, um, I am pretty aggressive when it comes to protecting my kids. I could probably get them, or hands and feet. I'm more worried about magazines and high impact rifles. And as far as the National Registry and um, uh, background checks, um, you may or may not know this, but all teachers in Massachusetts are mandated to be fingerprinted um, this fall, and 48 other states already do that. So if all the teachers in the state have to be fingerprinted and have national background checks, why not people who are buying guns? And one more thing, I worked on your campaign because you had a zero rating with the NRA. for gun sense in America, and I, I feel like um, I have heard some common themes today, and they are that no one wants criminals to have guns. I, I think that's a, something that could be viewed upon as common ground, um, and we don't uh, permit that in Massachusetts because our laws require background checks. However, we have noted that in New Hampshire and Vermont and Maine and in 33 states in, in, in the U.S., these are not requirements. Um, so I, I believe what we need to do is um, let our federal um, legislators know that we feel this way, and they work for us, they represent our beliefs, and you can easily um, email and write and call your congresspeople. Uh, a good website is um, contactingthecongress.org, and you can tell your friends in Massachusetts, sorry, in, in Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine and um, elsewhere in the country to do the same. Um, you know, I've also heard a lot about rights today, and, and you know, no one is t trying to take away the Second Amendment. Um, no one has brought that up. But I really feel I deserve the right to send my baby to first grade and not have him be ripped with 11 bullets from a, an assault weapon that's made for war. And I, I really think that that has to be very, very important. Um, and, and yes, it's uh, not common, um, maybe, um, that there are mass shootings. Um, but there were 16 in 2012. That, Newtown was the 16th one, and, and there's just too many. It's too many. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, my condolences, ma'am, and my thanks to the panel. Uh, as a teenager, I was taken by a family friend uh, to, his, to his gun club, and we were taught to tie a shoe, and I enjoyed it. I do support the Second Amendment, but I thoroughly support background checks and licensing on all guns. Um, the Austin Chiefs of Police, National Chiefs of Police Association, 
where the handguns come from that are proliferating our street, they will tell you, gun runners go to states with no gun laws, buy them and bring them back and sell them on the streets. Whitey Bulger is a perfect example on the top 10 most wanted list, and he had a stash of guns he bought while on the run. Please tell me how this is going on. It's because state-by-state -state gun laws do not work. You need national gun control. Uh, and to anyone in this room who needs a, a assault weapon to defend their home, can't do it with a small caliber gun, you need to go back to gun school and learn how to shoot. <laughs> I can defend my home with small caliber assault weapons. Um, the, oh, and the other thing, gun owners are pushing that we have school uh, police officers in all the schools. My community has five schools. That would come out to about $500,000 a year. So people in my community are supposed to put half a million dollars into the town budget because gun owners won't accept reasonable gun laws. We're not asking to ban guns. We want reasonable gun laws. That means getting rid of high caliber magazines, getting rid of assault weapons, and, and, and finally coming to the table with some reasonable ideas. Thank you. Thank you. We now practice lockdown in our school, and actually we've been doing it since Columbine. This will not solve the problem, and in fact, it puts it on our kids. So they now live in fear as we practice lockdown. Should somebody show up and start to start shooting at them, we have a false sense of security that we might be okay if we lock ourselves in our room, as they did in the town. So we are now putting this on our kids. Clearly the issue is guns. It is not our kids that are, should be having to deal with this problem. Putting officers in our schools will not do it either. Kids are in school to learn. They can't learn when they live in fear. Thank you very much. Just to note, we've closed off the line back uh, where Darren is with the uh, young lady in the blue sweater. Anybody after her? Just because we're already 15 minutes over the lot of time, we've kept all of our panel here considerably longer than we had promised them that we would. So I want to give those people that were up there before Darren did a chance to speak, and then we'll conclude. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joanne Viviello. I'm from Lyme, Massachusetts. I'm also the mother of two children. I just wanted to stand here and say I support universal background checks. I support President Obama's initiatives for gun control. I support a ban on assault rifles. And I, I, in response to the student who got up and said, what are we going to do to get the criminals? The answer is make it harder for them to buy guns. Yes, it's not going to stop everything. There's things that are illegal now. Cocaine and heroin is illegal now and people get them. But that doesn't mean we should start selling cocaine and heroin and make it very easy for people to get it. It won't solve the problems. It'll just make it harder for them. And one other thing I wanted to mention as I was standing in line, and I didn't come prepared to speak, but when I saw all the people here on the other side, I thought I'd get up. I couldn't help but think of the Butter Battle book. Do you remember that Dr. Seuss book where people started buying weapons and this guy built bigger weapons and bigger weapons and bigger weapons and bigger weapons until finally the absurdity is it. If you guys are all want to buy assault rifles, well, I don't even know because I don't watch horror movies. What's bigger than that? But should I go get one? It's crazy. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. My name is Robert Dorsen. I'm a lifelong resident of Lynn. I came up here with this little book with nothing written in it, but listening to people, I started making notes here. I just felt an I hope need they're to... all notes for two minutes or less. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I, I felt a need like that when I came up here and get in line. I saw everybody who had choreographed themselves brought through websites to get up here. Um, proliferation was a word that came to my mind before I heard somebody say it because uh, not only proliferation of, of uh, weaponry, but of ideas. Uh, I mean, I've heard buzzwords of, uh, of, of like uh, emotional overcorrection. Uh, Certainly, that's, that's uh, what they're doing is they're overcorrecting by buying all these weapons now and putting them on, on the streets for themselves. And, and uh, I saw a bumper sticker that said, if uh, guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. Well, the problem with that has been there since that bumper sticker has been out for 20 years is that all these people have committed these mass uh, genocides in these malls and, and, and uh, schools and, and, and theaters and, and shrines, is that I don't believe these people had criminal records before they committed these uh, assaults and, and, uh, and, and killings, but afterwards, when they would be tried unless they killed themselves, then they'd be outlawed. So that probably makes no sense. I got to throw them out. Um, 
And also, I think uh, there's probably some kind of statistics that the more guns that are in homes, theoretically for self-protection, the higher the rates of uh, horrible accidents in those homes that have resulted in killings, if I'm correct, of family members and others, because guns are in those homes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gail Brock, and I'm a resident of Swampscott, and I just want to say I'm for anything you can do to get rid of assault rifles, anything you can do to get rid of multiple bullet magazines, anything you can do to Here's get... Just one second. You know, all the people that are speaking now waited all that time while people that had an opinion spoke and they treated them with respect and were quiet. I think they have a right to the same kind of quiet. Exactly. I wanted to be one of the people who spoke for gun control in any form so that we can prevent the kind of tragedies that have happened in Connecticut in the last few months. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Robert Deininger. Um, first, I'd like to thank the law enforcement people um, when you prosecute criminals, when you catch criminals. That helps all of us. So thank you for taking the criminals off the streets. Um, with regard to gun control, a lot of the things that are being talked about now have been tried in the past. They aren't very effective. Um, but I have a question, again, for law enforcement people. Uh, we know that a lot of people use legal firearms to protect themselves and prevent crime. Um, it's not just gun crime, but a gun can prevent many other kinds of violent crime. And in your jurisdictions, do you keep track of how often that happens? <coughs> No, apparently not. For, for, further comment. Um, you're very good at collecting statistics that support your gun control position. It would be honest to also collect statistics that support the legal use of firearms for protection. And that's why we have an open microphone so that folks can share that information if they wish to. We're appreciative of it. My name is Peter Johnson. I'm from Beverly. I'm in favor of rational gun controls, including the types of model we have here in Massachusetts. Uh, recent polling indicates that 82% of Americans support gun control, including national background checks, and that includes members of the NRA. I think. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I'm Thank, sorry. You. Thank you for your apology. Thank you. I would encourage uh, those who are in favor of gun control regulations to speak out with as much passion as the people who are speaking out against gun control. And one, way, one way of doing this that I've been able to identify is to go to the Gabby Gifford Mark Kelly website, Americans for Social for Responsible Solutions. They are accumulating numbers of people who are in favor of their very modest beginning to gun controls. And I would encourage as many people as possible to tell everyone you know to do the same thing so that our voices can be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Hi, my name is Phil Calder, so I live in Wyoming, Mass. Uh, I voted for you, Congressman. Uh, thank you for holding this forum. Thank you for everyone for being here. It's a multifaceted problem, I think, that's represented by the nature of this uh, committee. Um, we've heard a lot of rhetoric on both sides. I don't think that that's particularly helpful. Um, we've heard a lot of statistics, and I, I can't remember the comedian who said, I think 80% of all statistics are made up on the spot. And um, I, I think that happened here today. I don't think that has really promoted a uh, rational discourse, unfortunately. Um, the major point I'd like to say is, is how sad this whole thing is, that in 2013, in the United States of America, we're talking about percentages. This should be a zero tolerance issue. One person killed is one too many. I don't care how we get there, but that's what we should be striving for. Thank you. Congressman, members of the panel, thank you for holding this discussion today. Um, this hasn't been mentioned yet, but I'm interested in gun-free zones. Most of these incidents have taken place in gun-free zones. I myself am a concealed carry weapon holder. Uh, I work from home. Most of the times when I leave my home, I go to the post office or to one of my kids' schools. I cannot legally bring my guns there. 
the president's proposed expanding gun-free zones. I don't see how a gun-free zone prevents, helps anybody. It prevents me from carrying my weapon. However, when I walked in here today, I didn't see anything that would have prevented me from actually having a gun on me right now, other than the fact that I'd be a felon. If I wanted to kill people, I'm really not concerned about that extra felony. So how exactly does the gun-free zones do anything except camp a law-abiding people that don't want to cause harm from defending themselves while putting a sign on the front door of fresh meat, come shoot here? Thank you for your comments. Hi, my name is Kara Kay, and I'm from Marlowe, Massachusetts, and I want to thank you for having this forum today, and thank you for all the protection and law enforcement providing. And I'd like to see these new groups being formed to give mothers a voice in this conversation. And I want to thank you and bring this message back to Washington that while I feel like other groups are more organized, and perhaps people, some people are feeling bull bullied in this room, go back to Washington and don't feel bullied by the NRA. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Susan Coviello from Essex. Um, I have so much to say in so little time. 25 years ago, we started having forums like this when we started talking about the AIDS epidemic. And we all stood in rooms like this talking about how to protect people from AIDS. 25 years later, and we always said, eventually, everybody you know is going to have been touched by the AIDS epidemic. And I bet most people in this room have, even obliquely. Now I'm trying to explain to my 84-year-old mother who summered in Sandy Hook uh, about the gun violence that happened there. Um, we don't call it an incident in our lives. We should call them catastrophes. Um, Adam, Lanza, Adam Lanza was not a criminal when he took, until he took those guns onto that school property. His mother was not a criminal. She owned those guns legally. He did not, they were not stolen guns. He took them from the house where he lived. I think those things are really important, and eventually we're going to be standing here wondering how close are all of us to the gun violence. Um, they're not incidents, they're not things that happened in the past, they're catastrophes, and we have to consider them catastrophes. So please keep up the good fight. I agree with the woman who spoke before me. Do not let the NRA bully you. And to the gentleman who spoke before her, I'd like to see America as a gun-free zone. Thank you. Thank you.